These Leaps talks are created with our partner Leaps by Bayer, the impact investment unit of Bayer. And I admire their approach to investing in biotech breakthroughs that are going to make the world a better place. The talk series by Leaps gathers brilliant minds to discuss the ethical and social challenges that may arise through biotech breakthroughs, something we at Symbiobeta agree is incredibly important. And I'd like to now introduce Jürgen Eckhart, who's the head of Leaps by Bayer, to provide some more context on what they do, why they're doing it, and why we're so passionate about this partnership and this Leaps talk today. Hello and greetings from Zurich. Thanks, John, and thank you, Symbiobeta, for hosting this Leaps talk. These are both fascinating and frightening times in the life sciences. Fascinating because the pace of biotech innovation in the last nine months has been astounding. Frightening as we see how disinformation can erode trust in science, undermining breakthroughs that might end the pandemic and other huge problems that people and the planet are facing. Watching the social dilemma made me reflect on some of the challenges we face in biotech. Leaps by Bayer was started five years ago with the aim of solving 10 huge challenges. We call them leaps. These include curing and preventing cancer, providing sustainable organ supply, and reducing the environmental impact of farming. But what if our companies are successful in developing cancer vaccines or growing transplantable organs in pigs, but people reject these advances because this information has eroded their trust in science? This is why I'm really looking forward to this Leaps talk with Tristan. Now more than ever, it's critical to have an open dialogue about scientific innovation. To regain trust and combat misinformation, leaders of industry, institutions, governments and civil society need to engage and work together with unprecedented transparency and clarity. We can't afford not to. So much is at stake. Thanks again, John and Tristan, for being here. And thank you all for joining. And in this Leaps talk, I'm going to be speaking with Tristan Harris, the co-founder of the Center for Humane Technology. Tristan has been called the closest thing that Silicon Valley has to a conscience. A former design ethicist at Google, Tristan and I are going to talk about his new documentary, The Social Dilemma. And we're going to explore what the synthetic biology community can learn about this digital moment in history. What happens when the technology of social media meets the biology of our minds? And how does this color the public conversation about how to tackle global challenges like hunger, genetic disease, and climate change? So Tristan, in your new documentary, The Social Dilemma, you talk about humanity moving from the information age to the disinformation age. This is particularly important right now because we're emerging from arguably the greatest 100 years of scientific and technological advancement, yet topics ranging from climate change to vaccine science are polarizing and dividing our society, even though the science is clear. So why do you think disinformation now is such a big problem for society? So I think we've entered into a totally new era where um, we went from a small number of people publishing information who were, let's say, trained as journalists, studied media ethics, had some notion of responsibility. You know, we, we left the yellow journalism era back in the, uh, I think it was the 1800s, or early 1900s, with the uh, Mexican-American War. And we actually went to war because of yellow journalism. So what is yellow journalism? Well, yellow journalism was the notion that I would just publish whatever I wanted to for my political purposes and to, embe to embellish and, and make salacious every claim to try to drive up political support. And between the different newspapers, that led to the Mexican-American War. Um, and what we need to do now is realize that we have uh, gone from a, um, a thoughtful, and you know, journalistically credited information uh, economy to one in which each of us are the kind of useful idiots for a larger attention economy. Because these technology platforms profit by turning each of us into content producers. That's what makes it so profitable. Back in the day, you know, Scientific American had to pay scientists and journalists to write those articles. That cost 
$60,000 a year per person or something like that. Today, you and I will happily write our own little comments for free and attract the same attention that those highly paid journalists would. So that's why these technology businesses are so profitable, is that we're like the little Uber drivers driving around attention, but we're doing it for free to the advertisements that the companies make. What that does, though, is it means that each of us individual people are the new journalists. But, and so we have great power, but we don't have the commensurate responsibility. It used to be that if you were going to reach a million people, you were a broadcaster, you were a publisher, you had real responsibilities. Now, think of on Instagram all of the d teenage celebrities who reach a million people but have none of the responsibilities. In our film, The Social Dilemma, um, there's even several TikTok and Instagram people that have millions of followers, and they talk about coronavirus and 5G conspiracy theories and how it's all planned by the government. They can reach a million people without any of the responsibilities that you would have had as a broadcaster or a, te or a, a television uh, producer. I think if you also compare, you know, YouTube uh, recommends things to people. YouTube is kind of the new global broadcast television. They actually recommended Alex Jones' InfoWars conspiracy theories 15 billion times. Wow. That's more than the combined traffic of the New York Times, Washington Post, Guardian, Fox News, MSNBC combined. It's really hard for people to get their heads wrapped around when you have a major broadcasting system that is by default uplifting the most conspiratorial and outrageous things. Then alone, you look at children, where if you have a teenage girl who three years ago on YouTube was looking at a dieting video, what would YouTube recommend? Well, what is YouTube trying to do? It's trying to get the most attention. It would recommend anorexia videos, not because anyone at YouTube wanted that to be the case, but because this amoral machine is just calculating what tends to keep people who watch these dieting videos here the longest, and there's this mysterious category of videos called thinspo, a thinspiration videos. So across every sector of our information environment, we went from having a values-first or a values-driven, you know, human editors choosing what do we want to see, what's worth our attention, what's credible or true, to one in which algorithms are amorally just recommending things where each of us have turned into the yellow journalists who are rewarded and we get more social feedback the more salaciously we embellish the story. These rabbit holes that you talk about in the movie, there's a very graphic description that, that particularly drew me into to a young guy who's being radicalized by what he's seeing on these, uh, on these algorithms. Um, I've, we've all been down these rabbit holes. They're amazing. You go down them. I, Joe Rogan, I, I, I went down the, uh, the, the whole Andrew Yang, Joe Rogan rabbit hole. Amazing. Really happy that I went down that rabbit hole. So can you talk a little bit about the, some of the negative rabbit holes and some of the positive rabbit holes? And then how do we, how do, I mean, can the algorithm differentiate? I mean, each of us have our own different rabbit hole. And as um, one of the former YouTube engineers who's in the film, uh, Guillaume Chaslow, who's a, a friend of ours, he built some of the recommendation system. And what he said is, you know, the YouTube algorithm, set, you, first of all, people should know 70% uh, of YouTube's traffic comes from the recommendations. So if you think, okay, there's a billion hours of watch time per day, so just imagine this huge TV station that's reaching like 200 countries, and it's, adver it's broadcasting you know, in, in dozens and dozens of languages, but 70% of what it's broadcasting is based not on what humans are picking and saying, hey, I wanna go to Andrew Yang, yeah, I wanna go to this. 70% is driven by that recommendation system, that right-hand sidebar. So, and it's, it's optimized to find what are some rabbit holes that might work for you. So if you've looked at a NASA moon landing, one of our friends is from a satellite company, and if you were looking at you know, old satellite footage, for a while, um, YouTube would recommend flat earth conspiracy theories. And it, as is shown in the film, he says we recommended flat earth conspiracy theories hundreds of millions of times. And I think a lot of parents, when they're busy with coronavirus and they have to sit their kids in front of YouTube for a few hours because they've got to do their work, and they you know, talk to their kids later that day, and their kids are saying, yeah, the Holocaust didn't happen, or you know, flat Earth conspiracy theories are, are real, the Earth is flat, why is everybody talking about it as if it's round? That's the world that we're now living in. And I think we have to recognize not just where we are, but that we're about 10 years in to this sort of, you know, the, the washing machine of social media spinning out all of our beliefs and ideas. Um, so it's not just that we have to fix the technology, we have to realize that we've been underneath this kind of spell that's, that's really warped our view of what is real and what other people believe, because now a larger fraction of society believes in more fringe conspiracy theories. Did you define the term, the attention economy? Um, I don't think I defined the term, the attention economy. Um, I think it was defined in some papers and work um, earlier, but it's a really important concept, because especially in the United States, we tend to focus on free speech. 
Um, and we tend to think in a, in a neoliberal society, in a liberal society, that the best answer to bad speech or speech that's misleading is more speech. Like if that's a bad idea, we don't want to clamp down on that person's ability to speak. We just want someone else to speak next, and we can debate what's true. That's the root of science. It's the root of liberalism. The problem is, in an attention economy, when attention gets scarce, when information becomes abundant, attention becomes scarce, because attention is the small pipe that all that information has to come down into. And if you compare 100 years ago, how many people could publish or speak, quote unquote, to all the people in the world? Like a very small number of people. You had hundreds or maybe a few thousand you know, publishers or broadcasters. What has been the incentive of technology companies? Well, they've given each of us three billion people, the ability to speak to millions of people. So if you think about it, it's like imagine you had a thousand typewriters or TV channels, and they have to fit into this finite amount of attention. We can kind of squeeze it in. But now, what if there's three billion typewriters and three billion TV channels, but we only have the same amount of attention? We just increased by orders of magnitude the amount of information that we have to sort through to put into the same small amount of attention which means that the concept of more speech being the answer to bad speech or to conspiracy, you know, false speech, isn't going to work. We actually have to have an attention economy that surfaces and signal boosts the wisdom and the things that tend to find more consensus. Um, a good example of this is actually in Taiwan, where the digital minister there has created a, an information system where people are debating what things they want to fix in government, and the system selects for when people who would um, be most likely to disagree when they tend to find consensus. So instead of being boosted by you know, whatever gets clicked the most or shared the most or commented the most, which just selects for outrage, basically the lizard brain becomes the top of our news feeds, so the amygdala kind of shines in the spotlight of, of our collective consciousness. Instead of that, um, Audrey Tang's work in Taiwan is to select for the things where there's unlikely consensus so that you, your society is, con is constantly confronted with things that they actually agree on that they didn't know that they agree on. GPT-3, one of these new technologies that's come out for AI-powered content production. Yes. So it can write newspaper articles, it could look at your quotes that it can find online and then synthesize new quotes. How are we going to deal with this on top of what we're already seeing in terms of the disinformation that's coming out there and the incentive structures that are in place for everybody to become a broadcaster? Yeah, I think this is such a huge issue because we tend to focus on with the issues of disinformation and social media yesterday's problems. You know, we, we all know about yesterday's issues, but GPT-3 means that you can manufacture user-generated content that will be indistinguishable from what a regular human does. As you said, you know, my everything I've said on the internet is on a bunch of text pages. The GPT-3 ingests all of that, and then you can say, hey, can you make up a quote about ethics with Tristan's voice? And it will synthesize a totally made up quote that even I will probably be impressed by for sounding insightful, because, and it'll be totally from scratch. There's even examples of, of, of GPT-3 writing entire philosophy papers about GPT-3 that sound pretty reasonable. Um, what's terrifying about this is that I think of GPT-3 as like a digital nuke for trust. Because now, what's real and what's generated by machines uh, is completely indistinguishable. And there's the quote in the film, you know, any sufficiently uh, advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. What this now means is that on any website, anything you see could just be, be made up by a machine. What makes this worse, sorry to go more bad news before we get to maybe what we do about it, is that human speech is also being simplified. So if you think about you know, technology making us speak in worse and worse grammar, and in simpler and simpler sentences and shorter three-letter words, it's easier and easier for machines to simulate things that sound just as real. And I think that what this means is we are going to move away from a user-generated content society into long-term brands and voices that we trust. Because even though The Economist or The Wall Street Journal or The New York Times could use GPT-3 to author articles, we will want to trust a smaller number of publishers who we hope we would trust them not to do that. Um, so I don't think anyone knows how this is going to turn out, but uh, we have to actually get our society aware that this is now possible. And if we think about the other tools and technologies that might become available to deal with this, Elon Musk talks about the need to upgrade the human brain, Neuralink, 
his company just demonstrated this implant that you can have. And he sees it as both an implant for inputting information into the human brain and, and taking information out of the human brain. What are your thoughts on, on this kind of human biohacking of the human brain to, to, to save humanity? My worry is that the way that we got to some of these dystopian realities right now came from the same optimistic ideas about extending these human ideals, like human connection or human thought or human creativity. Um, you extend human connection and, and, and spreading information and, and giving people a voice, and we just created this dark ages of information where no one actually knows what's true. So what I worry about with Neuralink is that if we don't sufficiently understand ourselves, then we're going to be manipulating ourselves uh, in ways that we won't see. A clear example of this is, you know, while we've all been watching out for the moment when technology would cross human strengths, when it would be smarter than humans, the Ray Kurzweil singularity, what's really gone on is we miss this earlier point when technology undermines human weaknesses. So when technology undermines our short-term memory, we feel that as a problem called distraction. If you have too many pings and tabs open, we get distracted. When, it, when technology undermines our dopamine reward system, we feel that as a problem called tech addiction. When technology undermines our reliance on stopping cues, that you do something, and then there's a finishing to your Doritos bag, a small Doritos bag, versus if the Doritos bag was bottomless and it kept going, that's how you get these infinitely scrolling feeds. Many of the examples where technology is harming us have to do with us not seeing our own weaknesses where technology has, has manipulated them. So an example with Neuralink is, our emotions, our paleolithic emotions are fixed. You know, as E.O. Wilson says, we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. If we don't understand our paleolithic emotions, for example, that we need social approval from others, what's to say that Neuralink won't just get hacked by the mass manipulation of social approval? You can be as smart as you want in your prefrontal cortex and, and simulate more possibilities, which is, I think, his vision, that I can see more moves ahead on that Garry Kasparov chessboard. But if we don't see that our emotions are pulled to, that person said something mean about me, and my evolutionary impulse is say, I have to really care about that because that's a threat to my survival. And that's what Twitter and Facebook and social media and TikTok for kids is so manipulative to. It's the fact that you say something, and next thing you know, there's a mob of 10,000 people who want to destroy you for the least charitable interpretation of what you said. And that is totally in the blind spot of how we make technology because I don't think we understand our own weaknesses well enough. So we talk a lot about dopamine and particularly in the film it talks about the risk of addiction, dopamine deficit states, some of the statistics about depression right now, particularly amongst teen suicides. In the documentary it talks about an increase up to 200 percent since 2013 in some cases of depression. And we're seeing this epidemic of mental health right now. What, what can be done if, uh, let's say, my, my eight-year-old daughter, um, who, who, we, uh, who isn't on social media yet, but what can we do to put in place some safeguards, some rails, so that by the time she's a teenager, she is not uh, having to deal with this? Well, I think we have to recognize first what's going on. So as you said, the stats in the film are um, especially teenage girls between 10 to 14 years old are most susceptible to some of these dynamics. You know, there's a stat in the film that I think in 20, 2018, 55% of plastic surgeons actually saw a patient who came in wanting to get surgery to look like their Snapchat filter that boosts their, their cheeks and their lips and their eyes. Um, because they liked how the technology is making them look, and you get more likes and rewards and approval when you look different than you actually do. So if you imagine teaching that lesson to children young, people like you if only you look different than you actually do. That's a damaging lesson to teach developing brains, obviously. Um, the most important thing people need to know is that most executives in the tech industry do not let their own children use social media. This is not an anti-technology conversation, by the way. This is not that the slab of glass in your pocket is this evil, dystopian, you know, dangerous, you know, satanic device. It's not that. It's that there's certain products whose business models are misaligned with our well-being and our values. And social media's business model is keeping people hooked and engaged because in that race for attention, it's more profitable to have you addicted to the product than to have you use it casually. So what can we do is we have to understand that this is going on. 
there's really no reason why teenagers need to mass adopt social media. I grew up on you know, technology and I loved it. I created all sorts of, you know, I, pro I did programming, I made art on technology, I created interactive applications, I did educational software. These things can be tools. The reason why teenagers are likely, even if they don't want to individually use it, to get sucked in eventually is because of social exclusion. What's so nefarious about our current technology infrastructure is that if I don't use it, then suddenly I can't participate with what my friends are doing. And that's designed just like cults. You know, The whole point of designing you know, in Scientology, it's the notion of if you leave, every one of your family members and your siblings and your friends, they're told to completely disconnect you from their lives, including your closest family. And that cost, you know, increasing the cost of social exclusion, is what makes, I think, these products so damaging to groups. So we need to do two things. One is we have to figure out how do we enable better group migration of teenagers off of social media so that they can get their entire school or class as a total sum off and into a non-manipulative place. Like FaceTime is a good example. Like FaceTime doesn't try to manipulate you into sending you all the hearts and the likes and show you 50 more people liked this thing and they're floating by. It doesn't do that because FaceTime's business model is not manipulation or advertising. So one is migrating and then the second is how do we make sure that, tech, that teenagers understand this and I think the film is actually a really good vehicle for up-leveling that understanding. Do you know the total size of the attention economy? I don't know the total size of the attention economy. I mean, the interesting thing to say about that is whatever size it is, um, you can double the size of the attention economy if you make everyone pay attention to two things at once. In other words, multitasking and distraction are profitable because if I can have you looking at the television and your iPad and your phone at the same time, I've just tripled the size of the attention economy. And in doing so, I'm fracking for attention because I'm pounding through the bottom of your brainstem to get even more out of that single human vessel. And that's why I think, you know, at the end of the film, we say, so long as a whale is worth more dead than alive and a tree is worth more as $1,000 of two by fours than as a tree, in the attention capitalism model, we're worth more if we're addicted, distracted, polarized, uh, irritable, and disinformed than if we're a nourishing, growing young kid or an informed citizen. If you could go back 16 or 17 years to Mark Zuckerberg's dorm room at Harvard and you're trying to help, yeah. trying to help prevent this from happening, what would, you, what would you have done? It's so many layers, right? Because one is the venture capital model that demands you know, crazy multiples of growth and infinite growth required him to move fast and break things and scale, blitz scaling, they call it in Silicon Valley, to grow around the world in every country as fast as possible, do deals with governments, get carrier deals, make every phone in Myanmar automatically have a Facebook app on the phone. So this kind of world domination mindset that actually in the New Yorker profile of Zuckerberg showing that he really admired, I think it was Caesar or some other Emperor Augustus or something like this, which is this kind of colonial world dominating mindset. And I understand where that comes from. He literally grew up as a kid playing Risk. But um, you know, that, that, was, that was his entire worldview. There's just so many levels of, of change that we need to have here. We need to have a more compassionate view of human nature. We need to not have a dominating and sort of colonial mindset in terms of um, racing around to grow fast at all costs. We need a different venture capital model where we invest in things that are thoughtfully done ethically. We need the media to reward more compassionate um, and thoughtful and humane leaders of technology. Uh, we need you know, policy that has different regulations so that there isn't the in maximum incentive to grow at all costs, regardless of that these other problems get dumped on the balance sheets of society. If you think about the search for truth and the search for reforming our organizations from our scientific institutions to our governmental institutions, what do you think um, do you see as the responsibility of these industry leaders to rebuild the trust in science and in information that's been eroded from this? I think the first thing is we have to realize what's happened to us. So when you look around you and you say, why is it that no institution has any trust and we've lost the fourth estate and to the extent that local newspapers exist or information sources exist, they turn into clickbait sites. So you know, every local newspaper you know has now turned into a local uh, a, a clickbait site. This is not real information. Um, it's also worsened the quality of existing journalism. Even the best journalism we have has turned into a simpler, less thoughtful, less nuanced form of, of journalism. It incentivizes the maximum and most immediate publishing. So just saying all that, I think what we have to do is rewind the clock and say, we have to have almost a truth and reconciliation commission about the damage that's been done 
not because I want to vilify evil people at tech companies. I think most people I know in the tech industry um, had the best intentions in mind, and there was just some, you know, the banality of evil. There's just these incentives to keep building, keep growing, and allow engagement and unchecked virality, and no one knew this would happen. But now that we've seen the costs, I think we have to have a real truth and reconciliation um, and use the funds of these, you know, the most profitable corporations in human history, and they literally have market caps of a trillion dollars. They have more money than God. They could use it to try to rebuild the society that's been eroded through their success. Um, and I think we're hopefully entering a period of that reckoning, um, and we'll see what happens. I love that Arthur C. Clarke quote that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. There's a lot of magic happening right now in the synthetic biology industry, from cancer therapeutics to living materials to sugar-free sugar. We're right at the cusp of a revolution here on reading, writing, and editing of DNA. But as an industry and as a community, we also care about the ethics of what we're doing, the impact that our technology is going to have on society, on our families, on our environment. What advice would you give us in terms of looking to the future to make sure that we don't fall foul of the same things that are happening in the tech industry right now? You know, I think it's important to recognize that if you just take social media as a different industry, but for the same concept of technological capacity being given to people, even with really good intentions, you know, the inventor of the Facebook like button is in the film. And he says, you know, when we envisioned the Facebook like button, we thought we were just spreading positivity and love. You know, they, how, where on your, your you know, consequence map, if you're trying to map out, like, well, what would be the negative and positive consequences of this? Could you have foreseen that this would lead to an increase in polariz political polarization because people would be liking things only in their filter bubbles? Could you have foreseen this would lead to an increase in teen suicides or depression because kids would get addicted to the number of, amount of feedback that they got? It'd be really hard to predict some of those things. I think one thing that people can do is to red team their, their thinking. You know, instead of saying, you know, we, we want to think optimistically, but ask you know, not just what, what great thing will come of this, but where is this vulnerable? Under what conditions is the very thing that I'm saying would be great for the world? Could it lead to the exact opposite of that? and actively sending your mind to, imagine a dystopia could occur from this positive thing. What might be those scenarios? And even have other people who are not part of the group you know, do that. I'm imagining some future world, maybe in a COVID society, um, where you know, technology teams could actually you know, dial in red teams to join their meetings to actually do that kind of counter analysis and say, let's actively poke holes in the thinking here. I think we don't have enough um, humility and skepticism of our own ideas because we're so optimistic. And I think people take, you know, self-criticism or self, um, you know, being, being cynical of our own thinking as almost like a put-down. And I don't think it has to be that way. It just has to be, you know, thoughtful. Barbara Marx Hubbard's quote that um, we, we've been granted the power of gods without the wisdom, love, and prudence of gods. If you can go in and edit someone's DNA or you can build, you know, microalgae that can suck down the carbon of the entire atmosphere, those are powerful technologies. That's the power of gods. But you know, just like being able to make something go viral to three billion people in less than 24 hours is, is a godlike power to spread consciousness and ideas across the planet. But we have to have the wisdom, love, and prudence of gods if we're going to have the power of gods. And I think one of the things that we've failed in the social media technology industry is you know, having that power but not coupling it with responsibility. You know, if I, I can go down to the kitchen store and buy a knife, and I don't have to give an ID or a driver's license, but if I buy a gun, which is a greater power, I have to have a background check and show my ID. And if I want nuclear ICBMs, I have to have a joint chiefs of staff that went to West Point and have to have consensus agreement and the president and all that if I'm going to manage that much power. When you're handing out godlike powers like Oprah, and you get godlike power, and you get godlike power, and you get godlike power, um, we have to be really thoughtful that we pair that great power with great responsibility. Um, and I think that's the way to think about power and responsibility being coupled in everything we do. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come to talk to us about it. Great to be here with you. Thanks again to Tristan Harris, the co-founder for the Center for Humane Technology, for today's Leaps Talk.